You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, and welcome to the No Labels, No Limits podcast, where we shatter the boundaries that hold us back and empower individuals to unleash their true potential. And I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest, Whitney Hinshaw Sullivan, who is both a remarkable leader, coach, Enneagram practitioner, keynote speaker, and team builder. And all of that is part of what makes Whitney so interesting to me. She's dedicated to helping leaders and teams thrive. And she does that with this unwavering energy and confidence and resilience. And I think that comes from her background in professional education, which she's had since 2011. She's honed that expertise into leading fitness, wellness, and student leadership programs. So she comes from the stunning landscapes of Bozeman, Montana, where I've spent some really cold nights camping. Um, yes. Very cold. Um, Whitney finds inspiration in nature's beauty, and when she's not empowering others, you're going to find her immersed in books, exploring the great outdoors, or guiding others on their cycling journey. So today, Whitney and I are going to touch base and talk about her invaluable insights and actionable strategies to break free from limiting labels and beliefs. So get ready to unleash your true potential and take bold action towards your goals and dreams. So now let's dive into a transformational conversation about resilience, grit, the Enneagram here and there, and then set back resistance with the incredible, incredible Whitney Sullivan. Hi, Whitney. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Well, it's so fun to learn about you. And, we, you know, I always love in the little pre-chats to get a couple of um, nuggets from you. So before we dive into how you got where you are today, um, I would like to know, like, what's the one thing that's happening in your universe this week that just keeps catching your attention? Mm, that just keeps catching my attention. Um, that's such a good question. And I was meeting with an entrepreneur friend uh, this morning, and I think, and this is kind of based off of anyone who watches Ted Lasso, right? And the theme, the big theme behind Ted Lasso is believing in yourself and believing in others and believing in what you have to offer. And I feel like the theme this week has been that message, especially in entrepreneurship. And I'm sure you found in your own journey that being an entrepreneur is a big mindset game. And, you know, to all the trials and, and triumphs of being an entrepreneur really requires such a strong belief in yourself and mindset and a set of resilient skills. And I feel like that was the theme of the week of just you know, keep building your momentum and um, keep believing in yourself as, you know, and that sounds so, that can sound so cheesy, right? But when it comes down to it, when those little moments that you really need to show up with confidence, um, you know, I just, I love some of the lines from Ted Lasso about how important it is to show up with that self-belief. And that's what, what me and a friend were talking about this morning um, as we continue to navigate our journeys being entrepreneurs. Well, how great that you have a friend to talk about that with. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes I get texts from one of my co-creators and stuff just saying like the today's text was, well, so I'm working alone. He's doing a ton of video editing because we're on this big production thing. Right. He goes, it's just me and the cats. Right. His wife's at work. Mm -hmm. Just thought I'd bounce an idea off you. I'm thinking, okay, but Mm -hmm. he really didn't need to. He just needed to like put himself out there and get a reflection. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that having your friend to share that with and that Mm -hmm. belief in yourself sometimes, Whitney, don't you find it's a matter of, okay, I'm I'm a little uncertain, but I'm standing up and I'm walking. I'm moving. Mm, Yes. And you keep moving forward and keep putting yourself out there. And the keep moving forward is something that it's kind of like a little inner voice that's kind of kept rising up um, this year. So absolutely. You just have to show up and keep moving forward and I love what you said too about like, you know, he's really talented. Sometimes we just need that little spark of energy from being yeah. seen, heard, and valued by someone else. Yeah. Well, otherwise you're in a vacuum. It wouldn't, mm-hmm. we're not in vacuums, but we perceive that, right? And we don't want to mm-hmm. bother people or whatever, but just those few minutes, 
right? And mm -hmm. in that particular case, it was 30 seconds to read the text. I'm not a fast texter, so it took me a little while to think about what to write back. And then I sent it, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, and he's often doing his thing. So anyway, that's all about appreciating community and connection. But mm -hmm. you weren't mm -hmm. always in that space. And one of the things that I um, found interesting in your background was, you know, the impact of being rejected from graduate school and how mm -hmm. that impacted you, right? And how that mm -hmm. became what you call a seismic shift moment. Can you share yes. a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I've always loved school. I've always loved learning. Um, you know, but when I kind of got towards the end of my undergraduate career, I was finding that my particular degree area, um, just wasn't really the fit for me moving forward. So I have, I have a health and wellness background, um, and I got a degree in dietetics, so nutrition, but I was like, Ooh, I don't actually want to be a dietitian. I found out <laughs> and, you know, I was starting to look at other options and I had this really amazing opportunity to be a graduate assistant. Um, at a campus record at a campus recreation department at the University of Nebraska. And, you know, I had the job. All I had to do was get into grad school and it was a little last minute. And so, like, I'm, you know, really hustling to pick a degree program. And I thought, like, oh, well, I'll, I'll go for master's of business. Like, that sounds like a great experience. It sounds like great transferable skills. It sounds like everything that I want to learn. Um, and you have to take a test called the GMAT. And that's kind of like the GRE. Um, but despite my love of learning, despite what I believe about my intelligence, I'm, I'm not the best test taker. And for the life of me, I could not get the test score that I needed in order to, for them to even look at my application. So despite my excellent references, all of my leadership experience, and I had a great GPA, they didn't even look at my application because my GMAT score wasn't high enough. And you know, that's really embarrassing. For one. Like, you know, I, I was like, Oh, my gosh, did I just get rejected from grad school? I mean, I never thought that I would come across that, you know, school was always such a strength for me. Um, but then I had to go tell my future supervisor, her name was Vicky, uh, that, you know, she's gonna have to hire somebody else. Because to have a graduate, assist graduate assistantship, you have to be in grad school, right? Um, and I just, I never imagined what she would say to me when I walked in to, to tell her that. And it, I, you know, I gave her the story and she just paused and looked at me and said, well, we'll have to get you into another program next semester. And, you know, that is one of the most life-changing moments that I had that happened in such a small moment. And it was all because my life path came up across someone who had a very clear purpose and intention that she was going to look at students as individuals. And she was so committed to student development. And, you know, she had a little starfish poem um, on her desk. And I don't know if you've heard the starfish poem, but it talks about how a woman's walking along the beach and throwing starfish back into the ocean. And someone comes in and says, well, you can't possibly get all of them. And then she just picks up another one and says, you know, it made a difference for that one. And so Vicky had that in her office and she eventually even got a starfish tattooed on her hand. Like that was like such a strong life purpose for her. And, you know, that life purpose coming up across my path really made this big shift in my life that eventually I got a master's of higher education leadership. And which ended up being a really great program for me. And then just the mentorship that I was able to glean from Vicky was so big for confidence, for resilience, for my ability to navigate my career with a lot of energy and kind of a sense of um, agency. Um, and yeah, and so I think it's just, you know, the message from all of that, how important it is for all of us to have a clear sense of what matters to us. And that, you know, impact happens in small moments way more often than big ones. Like that wasn't on the headlines of the Lincoln Journal star, right? In Lincoln, Nebraska, that, you know, educator makes exception for college student, you know, but that exception that she made for me to work as an intern for a semester and then reapply to a different program. I mean, that was life changing. And, you know, that, that is how we make positive change is when we just show up and have that clear sense of purpose and passion and, and skill and what we want to offer. And it is so powerful, but also that she didn't accept what was like 
these are the rules. You don't deviate from the yes. rules, right? So she said, well, let's, let's just see what we can do about that. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes it's so easy to go, well, we can't, instead of saying, mm -hmm. what's another way? Oh, I love that. Another yes. Way. What's another way? And it's like, you know, let's try something else. Well, and I always think the rules are there to make it easier for the people who are running, quote unquote, running the show, right? The admin, because mm -hmm. it keeps everything the same. I'm going, but if everything was the same, we won't have anybody who's individual enough to right. help learn and grow. Right. Absolutely. And what made Vicky so powerful, too, is that she was she had so much clarity in how her purpose was to show up and, and develop students that it wasn't even like, oh, let me check and see if I can make it. It was just like. Oh, okay, well, we'll figure that out. We got the sense. So much she didn't care. It's like no, she didn't care. <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, uh, that's so great. So now going forward, then you know, you talk, you have your keynote workshop, the resilience battery, which mm -hmm. by the way, I think that is such a great uh title and metaphor for what it's like, right? To just mm -hmm. keep going through the whole battery piece. But you talk about the importance of staying grounded, gritty, and growing in work mm -hmm. life and leadership. So I like the alliteration on that too. Could you share a key insight from that and um, and maybe how that has particularly had a profound impact on individuals and teams that you've worked with? Yeah, absolutely. And I think where that came from is, you know, well, first of all, just the idea that our resilience is like a battery was something that I learned after going through a big period of burnout and, you know, reaching a, a place in my career where I really did hit the red. And, you know, I really had to like work my way back up through orange and then yellow into green. And then that's where the grounded gritty growing came because in that space of being burnt out, of starting a new career, having lots of life changes. I mean, it was really like a resilient season and I had to learn new strategies to stay resilient. And that's where the grounded gritty and growing came from and so to me resilience is the mindsets and habits you know that that keep you in those the three g's space and really nurture your capacity for the challenges in our in your life because i don't i think humans all have the capability to be resilient sometimes it's the capacity that we have to nurture and so where this comes in especially with clients is you know, I think it's a really shared experience that sometimes we hit the red, we hit a state of overwhelm, we hit this state of like, oh my gosh, like I'm really overwhelmed and I don't know how I got here. And so where this tool has been really helpful for clients and for teams is to create this language of, okay, here's the signs and strategies of the green. Here's what yellow looks like. Here's what orange looks like. And here's what red looks like. Because I think sometimes we tend to wait to manage our energy or our resilience until we hit the red. Yeah. When really, when we can manage our energy and our resilience and our stress in the green, we can make a little bit more just give and go changes rather than these big swooping changes. So the grounded, gritty, growing, I kind of view as... You know, I like to think of like when I'm traveling, I have an iPhone battery, right? When I'm traveling, like I'm on offense with that battery, right? Like any, if I, the moment I hit the airport, I'm looking for like a plug-in because I am keeping that battery in the green. Because when you're traveling, you never know what crisis could or happen or what is. challenge. You don't know where your next charge is. And so it's like, man, you go on offense. So to me, the grounded, gritty, growing habits is like going on offense with your own resilience battery and making, and those are the habits that keep you in the green rather than just always playing defense with your energy and waiting until you get into that orange or red zone before you make a change. But instead building this system, you know, these mindsets, these habits that keep, keep you in the green and go on offense with them. Well, give me or and our listeners one or two examples of being on offense. From being the, on offense. Yeah, being on offense in the yellow and then the orange and then the red. Because, you know, having been in all of those and, you know, mm -hmm. it's this kind of wave, right? But honestly, when you're in the red, it it's even worse because you mm -hmm. there's that wonder, am I coming out of this, right? Like, mm -hmm. am I always going to feel this, like, I, uncreative, lack of spark, mm -hmm. right? When you're really burnt out and you don't want to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, exactly. So how about and a couple of strategies? Yeah, absolutely. So starting with staying grounded, you know, the things that keep us grounded are 
the mindsets and habits that keep us connected to our own vision, values, and inner voice. And, you know, those are like turbocharges to keep you in the green. And, you know, things, the things that make life feel like they're moving at a manageable pace, because part of stress, like what makes stress stress is that life is moving at a pace where you feel like you can't cope with it. You feel like you can't keep up with it. So when we have grounding habits in place, like exercise, nutrition, journaling, um, getting into nature, going outside, engaging with our creative habits, those are the kinds of things that help us feel like life is moving at a pace that we can digest and a pace that we can keep up with. So I'm curious, like, I'd be curious to know, what do you do to stay grounded? Like what helps you stay feel I've, like life I've moves at a manageable a ninja place on this in the last mm-hmm. like year and a half because more stress had come on right with some health issues with family members and stuff mm-hmm. and all of a sudden i realized i was in that place of going i don't think this is sustainable right not for me because mm-hmm. i'm like but i could mm-hmm. feel my shortness i was getting short and you know you always right. start with the people closest to you not the mm-hmm. public not the right clients. like right run. so um so i just made a commitment that I would change what I was eating slowly, not like this overhaul thing, but like, am I getting enough of the right things? But am Mm -hmm. I sleeping enough? And am Mm -hmm. I outside enough? Because if I can be out in nature, even for 30 minutes, it really Mm -hmm. shifts my head. So my Mm -hmm. dog is my cheerleader, right? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. But that has helped me. But the other thing that has helped for me, Whitney, is um, permission to say no. Mm, permission mm-hmm. to hand over because you know like you have this sense of i want it to be a certain way and i asked my this was an i talked to myself a lot mm-hmm. and like last september when it was really kind of this crescendo i asked myself what's the worst that could happen if i just handed over decision making to the rest of the team mm-hmm. right i showed mm-hmm. up it wasn't like i wasn't participating doing my part but what if i just said what is the best way you guys think we should go right i want to tell mm-hmm. you what some great decisions have come out of that. And my stress yeah. level came down, right? Because they're Absolutely. super smart, super creative. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I should have been doing this a long time ago. And those things really help protect our energy and help yeah. nurture our capacity to stay in the green. And that actually goes into the next category of habits, which is staying gritty. And what I heard you say there was like, you're learning what to grit and what to quit, right? Yes. Like. And I think that sometimes the toughest thing to learn that I personally had to learn when it came to nurturing my resilience battery was learning how to be a good quitter. And that like part of my burnout came from not quitting. (laughs) Like, you know, we can't do everything. We have to know what to limit, which are our boundaries. We have to know what to quit. And then we have to know what to grit. And, um, I have a, I have a couple of definitions I could share on this if Please you want to hear it. Please do. So, um, and so in my journey back from burnout, um, I, I ended up like articulating the difference between grit and quit because it was just this, you know, personal thing I was having to work through. And what I found was, you know, to grit is staying the course and working hard when the easy but wrong thing would be to quit. And to quit is letting go of what's not working and moving on when the easy but wrong thing would be to grit. And I'll repeat that because it sounds convoluted, but it's so. Yeah, it's kind of a head twister. So so let's say it one more time. Mm -hmm. To grit, staying the course and working hard when the easy but wrong thing would be to quit. And then to quit is letting go of what's not working and moving on when the easy but wrong thing would be to grit. And like articulating that really helps me untether my identity from being a quitter. Like we are just like shift that relationship of like, we have to move on from things that aren't working. And sometimes we only stick with things because it's actually easier to keep going than it is to stop. And so we get going so fast, we don't even have time to step back and go, why am I mm -hmm. even doing this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is this an alignment with like Mm -hmm. you talked earlier about being in alignment with, you know, your values and all of that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we can, we change, we are not right. Right. We are not stagnant. Absolutely. And especially when we get in the yellow zone, 
I would say that's when we really got to look at what we need to limit, what we need to grit and what we need to quit. You know, when we're in the green, those are great times to like practice all those habits and routines of the grounding behaviors. But when we get in the yellow, you know, the first thing I start to feel when I'm in kind of that yellow zone or that life is picking up at a pace I can't maintain. I'm like, all right, what am I quitting? <laughs> you know, and it's like, and quitting also can just be like, what do I need to accept as is? What do I need to delegate? Like you said, what do I need to discard? What do I need to outsource? You know, there's quitting has lots of different yeah. functions. It's not just throwing in the towel, right? Absolutely. Well, and I, I loved what you said about what do I need to um, like, not make so important you know there's things mm -hmm. like okay I, I need because we have these stories in our head about how things need to be right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we put those rules up there we can change those yeah rules, right exactly and I, so and i this i want to segue in and talk about your enneagram work because this reminds me of that of when we are more self-aware right mm -hmm. and it's hard mm -hmm. to be self-aware when you're stressed and on autopilot or in reactive mode but mm -hmm. the more self-aware we are, for me, I, uh, there were moments just this past week where I thought, am I, do I really care about that? Or is that just an automatic response? You know, mm -hmm. and the minute I said, I don't really care about that. And then my follow-up is then why are we even thinking about that? Right. Right. Move on. Right. Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter. And, but mm -hmm. those, and then I have to laugh because I'm going, man, I've done that for years, like making it harder on me. <laughs> right right so but that's a releasing not quitting mm -hmm. i'm not quitting being who i am i'm just going it no longer serves i love that but it no longer serves and that's you know why in the definition of quit is letting go it no longer serves and that can include just accepting something as is and i think we get so focused on everything has to grow you know that you know sometimes growth in mom in a moment is acceptance and releasing it like you said yeah Sometimes the growth is us being able to do that, not something external. Yeah. It's like, time yeah. to grow, Sarah. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, it's so fun when you can have some humor with yourself. So, okay, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about the Enneagram because we mm -hmm. both are coaches in the, and use the Enneagram. Will mm -hmm. you share with our audience your number, mm -hmm. what you've learned about yourself? And um, let's start there. Yeah. Um, well, I am a self-preservation four, so I'm an SP4, um, which means that my core motivation is to be significant. And um, I'm like, a, I, I had to like pause there. I had like a download of too much information about what I've learned from my Enneagram type. <laughs> Did you just switch over to your five wing right there with the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I need to like, I need to like switch over there. I, I just had this like brain dump of like, where do I even start with you know everything that I've learned from my Enneagram type? Well, and, let's start with this. Know, what was the most surprising thing to you when you first started the Enneagram? Oh. <laughs> Um, I'm laughing because the most surprising thing was also the most embarrassing thing. Um, <laughs> I think what I like about the Enneagram is it really shows you your blind spots and, you know, blind spots are those gaps in awareness that negatively impact your relationships, responsibilities, and results. And I would say the most surprising and embarrassing thing that I learned from knowing that I was a four is that I'm dramatic. I'm moody. Um, I'm, my energy is temperamental. Um, I can be overly sensitive. Um, I can tend to believe that I'm fundamentally flawed. Um, I can get stuck in my feelings. You know, so these are kind of cringy things to learn. And I remember when it said like, well, type fours, you know, can tend to be dramatic. I was like, Oh, oh. I'm not dramatic. And then I was stuck on it the rest of the day. And then the later, and then like, once I finally settled down, I was like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and cause I would say I definitely have like a dominant five wing and then the SP for the, that, that particular subtype tends to be a little more stoic than, um, some of the other types. So that explains maybe why it didn't resonate with that right up front. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, Hmm. I can be a little dramatic. <laughs> I can't get stuck in my feelings, you know, in an unhealthy way. Um, but I would say in particular, the thing that was really life changing for me to learn from the Enneagram was this, this blind spot, this belief I had that was fundamentally flawed, that I was missing something in myself in order to like reach my full potential. And I would say that was a key part of moving on from higher education 
moving out of burnout and, and starting a business, because I think I learned from the Enneagram, you know, my, my energy is, you know, not the most steady energy and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Right. You know, it's not, it's not what's wrong with me. It's like, maybe what's wrong is my environment doesn't suit my energetic needs. And so part of what moves me into entrepreneurship, which surprised me, I never really thought I'd be an entrepreneur was like, I get to manage my energy. And I'm sure as a type five, you know, you get to appreciate that you get to manage your oh, energy I in the am, way that you I want to. I am totally praying at the yes. end of your energy. Right? Yes, exactly. And I get to manage my energy in the way that works for me. Um, and so, you know, those are really big things to learn and to move past those self. And again, I love the name of the podcast, right? No limits, no labels. Like I, I had to move past that limiting belief that there was something flawed about me, you know, and that the only thing that was flawed about me was my limiting beliefs about being flawed. So yeah, it's the fallacy. It's the story. That's not true. Right. Mm-hmm, you're absolutely. The way you are. Exactly. But we do mm-hmm. self-sabotage it because we think there's things that aren't so great with us. I know it's like when you learn your blind spots, someone, the way I loved hearing it best was someone says, that is the cringeworthy moment. Ooh, yeah, it's cringe. It hurts. It stings. And it's true. I mean, you yeah. Think of, okay, as much as I'd like to call that wrong, if I just sit with it for a while, okay. But, you know, it's great to have that information because then you can Mm -hmm. that for me, I use that when I can feel myself shifting into that response. It tells Mm -hmm. me I'm either under stress. Mm -hmm. I have ignored what I need to do for myself in the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I need to get grounded, stay Mm -hmm. ready, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. But it's like, okay, it's a little flasher. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. hey, hey wake up here you're being like you're reactive you're not being proactive or truthful to Mm -hmm. you um so it's a great way to get real with yourself and increase your self-awareness and Mm -hmm. don't you love how the more you know the more you know you need to know yes and i think that that's what's really like drawn me to use it as a coaching tool so i use the enneagram with every client that i coach and because it's just it's such an evolving system and you know it really is a system it's not just a it's not just a personality test it really just shows you all the ways that you can use it to be authentic and evolved which i think is super powerful yeah well and i i remember i was with um a couple um leaders that i was coaching and one of the gals she says i just i just you know things were getting tough and my staff really liked it when i got really directive and i'm just listening Mm -hmm. right and mm-hmm. she goes, what do you think? And I said, I think you were a perfect number eight under stress. Yeah. <laughs> right. And she started laughing because she recognizes that. And she goes, it worked well. I said, sure, because everybody knows that pattern, right? They're mm-hmm. used to it. It's familiar, but that's mm-hmm. not where you want it to be. So, you mm-hmm. know, but it was so fun because she caught it and said, yeah, I know there's better ways to be. But I said, but you were under tremendous stress. We all do that when we're under stress, mm-hmm. we default. Mm-hmm. Right. So absolutely. I like how the Enneagram can allow us to have a little more grace for ourselves and for mm-hmm. others. And then mm-hmm. also, when you think about all the different types and what they bring, could you imagine not having that variety around you? Oh, absolutely. And it's just brilliant. Um, you know, my husband is a nine. And it's just like, again, like the the energy that we can bring each other in our relationship is just so powerful. Right. So I'm over here like in my feelings and emotions a lot. And the type nine is just like, I'm just present with you. I'm not making any meaning about this. I'm not projecting past or future on you. I'm just with you in this moment, you know? And so it's like the ways that like we can learn to show up for each other um, when we have that language. And I think the Enneagram just gives you such great language for how you can respond to any given situation. And instead of just reacting you know, you create that mindfulness in that space to choose your response. And the Enneagram gives you that language as to what response might suit that moment. So when you use it, or do you use it with teams or just individuals? You use it with teams. I do use it with teams. Yep. So sh- I know some of our listeners also do that, as do I. But mm-hmm. I'd like to know maybe one of the things you, ways you like to use it with teams. Mm-hmm. So I'm certified through the IEQ-9 and um which is integrative enneagram solutions they it's called the ieq9 assessment and i'm actually working on a team retreat at the end of this month where they're running the team reports 
And I think the team report is just really cool. So each person gets the professional report, which shows lots of leadership, extra leadership insights that the standard report doesn't have. And then the team report does for the team what it does for the individual. And what I love about it is that it's like this neutral party, you know, so like, you know, that team report will just put out there what your team's blind spots might be or what your team's weaknesses might be. And like, it's just out there and then we can just talk about it, you know, and it, and then you don't, and it's just that transparency. And then no one had to like, no one had to call it out. Right. Like, does that make sense? Like, it's just out there. It's there. So let's talk about it. Yeah. And I think that's what I really like about um, using that team report with teams, but then also Oh, and I don't know about you, Sarah, but like, I love the energy that comes when people learn their type. And I always ask them to share what's one thing you want other people to know about your type. And, and then I ask the group to share what's one thing that's great about working with that type. And just the connection that happens in that space. Oh, like, that that's just it, it truly changes the dynamics of the team like when it when the team can come together and feel like they're seen valued heard understood the energy that comes from that connection is just really powerful and i think the enneagram facilitates that really well i think so too i like how you describe it as a neutral and when i'm not using my free assessment i use the iq9 also because i awesome. do like the detached way that it just says here's some things you might look at I really like the stress level. I'm like one. Yes. Yes. Here's a couple of leaders who one of them's totally in the green. The other mm-hmm. one's like, wow, wow, flashing red. I'm going, oh, right. Let's talk about how this needs to, you know, mm-hmm. you guys want to see this shift and what. Absolutely. Um, and it starts some good conversations about what support might look like to get that strain level. Or, you know, if we use resilience battery terminology, how do you get back in the green? on your strain rather than, you know, all red or orange on that report. And, you know, I think leaders wouldn't know, right? Like they might, they might not know. Yeah. Cause it, it, it is, it's vulnerable to bring up, but like then when the leader has that kind of sense of, Oh, like there might be something going on in this person's personal life that I don't know about that's, you know, pretty valuable information to know. It is. And I think our teams, at least the folks I work with te- tend to be the organizations tend to be pretty close knit. Mm-hmm as a group Mm -hmm. they're doing human service work and work in the community. So they tend to know each other, but also there's this reluctance to put your needs above people who you're Mm -hmm. serving, right? Because Mm -hmm. obviously their needs are very urgent. I'm going not any more than yours. Mm -hmm. So, but I have a question about the team report because I'm not familiar. I haven't used that yet. So Mm -hmm. in the team report, does it compare the stress across the team as well does it highlight any of that or do they bring their individual reports with them and if you were to use it has yeah it has a team strain level on it but that's a good question and i'd have to actually double check to see if it's just because i know that there's the team strain but i would have to double check the report to see if there is also a way that you can see the individual level of strain I asked for a very personal reason because one of the, my upcoming retreats that I'm doing with this group is to address some of the strain issues and how they want to mm-hmm. how they want to take care of themselves, right? And I loved when you said it's hard to know. Right? It's hard to know. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually thinking, you know, I'd have to double check and see what if that's team level or if it's individual. But I feel like it shows the individual in some way or another. Okay. Yeah, if you check that and let me know. But yeah, I'm I'll check it later. <laughs> reports with so welcome, listeners. This is a tip yeah, exactly. Day. We're just having this chat. Yeah, it's a brainstorm it's session. Yeah, yeah. So here's our brainstorm session. But the the report is a big one, just like the individual reports. So I have to double check. Yeah, I really like the reports. They're super helpful and actionable, mm-hmm. um, especially yes. if you don't try to eat them all in one bite. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So as we're winding this down, I want to come back to your talk on resilience, because I Mm -hmm. think especially now or continuing now, um, resilience is super important. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, we have a deep well that we can fill as you're talking about. But um, let's talk about how we might be able to limit 
certain things? Like, what are the things that you would suggest if someone says, I am overwhelmed, I don't even know where to start mm -hmm. and what to limit, right? Even mm -hmm. though there's no labels, mm -hmm. no limits, there are limits. Right, right. What are some you limits? Have, you have to create limits so you don't have limits, right? Exactly. Um, you know, um, my husband and I call that the freedom of commitment. And that's not a Whitney original phrase. That's from Mark Manson. Um, he's an author, um, a pretty, a, a pretty well-known author here. And he wrote some good books, but he talks about the freedom of commitment. And, you know, and that's what I think of is like, what are your top priorities that you're going to devote to each day? And I actually have an assignment that I'll give clients sometimes that's called the to-do list audit with just you know, it's six ways to, you know, figure out how to prioritize what you, what you need in a day. Um, and so the limits that I can think of are, are just like, what are the limits that help you feel safe, secure, and self-assured to approach the day? And, and really when we talk about limits, we're talking a lot about boundaries yes. and limits are what you will do. And so like you had asked about books and the prep work. So one of the books I'd recommend for readers is called the book of boundaries. And one of the biggest mindset shifts that Melissa Urban, the author, talks about is that boundaries are what I will do that maintains my safety and my security. And so, for example, you know, I had um, I had kind of a stressful week a couple of weeks ago. You know, it was just there was a lot of things going on in one week. And on Monday, I kind of had to look at my week and say, OK, like. What are the things I absolutely have to do, which is grit? <laughs> what are the things that just aren't really that important, which was quit? And then what are the things that I need to limit? And so, you know, grit was, you know, I have these speaking events, like I have these activities. These are the things that I, you know, they're what I'm doing. This is my passion. So I'm gonna, I can't quit those. I can't limit those. But then like I'm a cycling instructor on the side. So sometimes when I get busy, that's the first thing I'm going to quit. You know, I'm going to put subs up on the sub board. You know, that is just not, I want to be reliable to, you know, the people that attend my class. But at the same time, you know, it's an extracurricular, like um, it's extra credit in the grand scheme of my schedule. So that's the first thing that quits. And then limit is when I start making calendar reductions and I'm sure an Enneagram five can relate to this. And that's oh, when so I start I've gotten going good at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I would say like, when I think of limit for me as a type four, someone who really has to manage their energy as you know, I have to start limiting how much energy out. And lots of times that's just extra meetings that don't belong um, limiting transitions is a big one. You know, just how many transitions you have in a day is something that I make sure to limit as well. Say why and that's so it's a drain, Whitney. Talk about transitions. Oh. I don't think people understand necessarily what that does to your, both your energy and your resilience and all of that, because it's a cost for mm -hmm. transitions. Mm -hmm. So there is an energetic and, and brain cost every time you switch a task or any time that you need to move from one thing to, ne to the next. And whether or not we want to believe it, humans are not good multitaskers. We are single taskers. And so every time you disrupt your focus, it's harder to get that momentum again. And so my husband and I talk a lot about slack time and buffer time. And I would say if there is one thing that every leader could do in the next week to improve their to charge their resilience battery is making sure that you have 10 minute breaks in between all of your meetings and allowing that time to transition because that's just not how your brain works. And like, when you think about, you know, just having to, I think we learned this in the pandemic, how exhausting transition transitions were, right? when we were all staying at home, we we're like, Oh, I have so much time in the day because, you know, I'm not driving here or driving there or going to this being going to that being all of a sudden we have all of this extra time. So transitions in themselves can just be really energetically taxing and they're always going to take more time than you think that they are. Yeah. I was just listening today to a book and um, one of the pieces of advice is assume everything's going to take three times longer than you plan for it to. Yes. And assume that your assumption needs extra time on that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so true, right? Yeah, I know I started yeah. planning in on my calendar, like I know I have to be somewhere, drive time. So I'll put an mm -hmm. hour in for a 20 minute drive because who knows what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But just mm -hmm. so I arrive where I'm going. Right. So, and actually in early. 
Exactly. And, you know, the flow state is so important and the flow state is sensitive, but that's where we do our best work when we're in this flow state, but if we're just constantly transitioning all day, you know, or just not accounting, like you said, for enough time. And I tease my husband about this. He's a not, he's a type nine. So I tease him all the time. He's like, yeah, I'll do that. (laughs) What's the rush? And like, he'll be like, I'm going to paint that. It'll take me like an hour. I'm like, that is not going to take you an hour to paint that whole room. Like you got to tape it. Like you have to like, you have to coat it and prime it. You have to let it dry. And so I always tease them that like, I'm like, you need to take that by like four. You know? yeah. I think your enthusiasm is good, honey, but. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm like, I need you to drop into that type six a little bit more. <laughs> Come on over. Um, yeah. But how great that you can recognize that in each other mm-hmm. and Absolutely. have some fun with it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. We have lots of fun. We talk about the Enneagram um, a ton. Like, and he, he really loves it, too. He's in a leadership position. Um, he's, in, he's moving into school leadership. So, you know, especially for leaders, like just having that emotional intelligence and that extra language for how people think, feel and behave is you know, it's really empowering. And I've seen how empowering it's been for him and for the leaders that I coach as well, just to have that deeper sense of understanding of how someone might operate. Well, and it helps you um, pause before you engage, right? Mm-hmm. I know that when I learned that about myself. And I was going backwards and thinking, well, no wonder I flew off the handle at that, even though I didn't outwardly do it. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking mm-hmm. because it violated everything I hold essential for how we interact with people, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I went, oh, baby, when the when I blew, I blew. Um, yeah, yeah. But the lesson there is don't hold it, communicate mm-hmm. it and let mm-hmm. just let it be. So yep. as we wind this up, I would like to give the mic back to you to share some closing thoughts and then where people should best reach out to you. Right. Ooh, closing thoughts. I'm like, we, we went lots of fun places. I know. Today. So go wherever you want. <laughs> um, you know what? Let's put a bow around how resilience in the Enneagram comes together. And here's how you can use the Enneagram for your resilience and how you can be grounded, gritty, and growing. So each type has a virtue that they move towards. And that virtue acts like a grounding habit. And then what's cool about the Enneagram is that it shows you where you move in stress, but those moves in stress can also show you the habits you need to stay gritty and what limits you might need to set. And then the Enneagram also shows you the habits you need to have in order to reach security. So we have that security line as well. So for those of you that are familiar with the Enneagram and curious about how that ties in, I was like, I'll just, I'll wrap up, I'll put a bow on um, how the three G's of resilience make, you know, go into the Enneagram. Um, but how you can get a hold of me is um, my website is WhitneySullivan.com. I offer Enneagram team trainings. I do Enneagram coaching. Um, and also the, the resilience battery and the three G's of resilience is a keynote or a webinar um, that I offer teams. So if you're planning a conference keynote, if you have a team webinar, if you're worried about your team being burnt out or, you know, just want those tools on workplace wellness. Um, you know, that's something that I offer as well, but, um, I'm active on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. So I'm hope to see everyone there. Well, we'll definitely put those links in the show notes. Um, Whitney, it's been so fun talking with you. We did kind of go left and right. And yeah, I was like, we'll tie it all together. <laughs> I'm glad you could put a bow on it. Cause I'm, I'm not that quick on the bow. I would, th- I I would have thought about it tomorrow. I'm going to go. Oh Yeah. I know yeah, well, you're like, we, question. I know you're like, what's one more thing you want to say? I'm like, oh, so many things. <laughs> I know that's always, I love the podcast because the guests are all so different and unique. And of course you are. And then I just really resonated with what you were talking about. So I, so such a gift of your time to us, myself and the listeners to be on the no labels, no limits podcast. Folks, if you enjoyed listening to Whitney, I have two requests. One is to check her out on her social media, reach out to her, learn more about her. Um, The second is to rate and review this episode because that helps bring not only more awareness to this podcast and helps people get out of limiting labels and beliefs, but helps Whitney out in the world and the work that she's doing. So doesn't take long to do that. Just do it. Know that you've contributed to Whitney and the rest of the No Labels 
no limits world people. And um, with that, I just want to thank you all for being a listener on this week's podcast. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash No Labels, No Limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review, and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, Keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.